Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session number 46. In this Law Society of Ireland recording, Alwyn Daw and Julie Breen talk to Justin Purcell about why dignity matters at work. You're very welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, it's just turned one o'clock, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, uh, welcome to Small Practice Information Session 46. Uh, I'm here with uh, Owen Daw and Julie Breen, uh, and we're here to discuss dignity matters at work, a really important uh, topic. And we spend so much time at work that it, 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 it's really important that, uh, that our dignity is respected. So, so Julie, over, over to you. You're all very welcome. And thanks everyone for coming today. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, Justin. Um, so thanks. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here with Alwyn today. Um, Alwyn is working as an expert advisor with external consultant Crow, who are delivering, delivering the Dignity Matters survey. So we felt it was really important for Alwyn to meet the profession and to share her knowledge and experience with everyone. Um, just to give you a bit of background um, to the Dignity Matters project, which we will be talking about today. Um, at the Law Society's 2020 AGM, a motion was passed that the Law Society commission a profession-wide profession -wide survey similar to that carried out by the International Bar Association on bullying and sexual harassment. Um, and uh, it was also, part of that motion was to implement recommendations from the IBA US2 report. So today we will talk a little bit about work that's been carried out so far to fulfill this commitment, the, the Law Society's Dignity Matters survey. And we'll also reflect on how this survey can help drive change in the solicitor's profession. Um, but before we move to having a conversation with Owen, I just thought I would frame the conversation in some findings that have come out of the IBA US2 report, which was um, released in May 2019. And the research was carried out across 135 countries and they had over 6,000 respondents. So this IBA report is the IBA report that instigated the Dignity Matters survey and um, that we will talk about today. Um, but some of the findings that we thought would be useful to bring to you today are that one in two female respondents and one in three male respondents have been bullied at some point. One in three female respondents and one in 14 male respondents were sexually harassed in a work context at some, at some stage. We also found out through these, this research that targets don't report, so targets of bullying and sexual harassment don't report due to the status of the perpetrator, fear of repercussions, and because often the incident of bullying harassment is so endemic within their workplace that they don't feel like they can actually um, report it. So, that's just really to frame the conversation. Um, Alwyn, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to talk to you first of all. I mean, are you surprised by those findings? Um, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I mean, my experience particularly over the last couple of years has been working with the arts community and there has been quite a, I suppose, a substantial um, sector-wide conversation internationally really about the prevalence of bullying and harassment. Um, and so actually what the IBA report in a way kind of chimes in with a lot of what we know either anecdotally or through media coverage um, in relation to experiences of people working in any sector. I mean, I know um, the legal profession is, is probably in lots of respects no different to any other sector where, you know, there are um, individuals with quite a lot of power and status mm -hmm. and those entering a profession you know really really keen to get on and um you know build their career up and so you know the sort of shall we say norms or cultural expectations that you know certain things happen a certain way often aren't challenged for that very reason because mm -hmm. people genuinely are feeling like well this is just what I have to put up with so you know I'm just gonna have to get on with it and mm -hmm. um, the downside to that being obviously for the individual to you know put up with those under those sort of experiences it has a can have a very deleterious effect on your health your mental mm -hmm. health 
your well-being and also your enjoyment of your career, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to be to be in that situation on an ongoing basis has a very, very substantial effect on an individual. So um, I think, you know, what, what we're talking about today is really important for many reasons. Um, not least of all that, you know, people do feel that they can, through this survey, speak honestly about their experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, because ultimately, you know, as you said, Julie, at the top, you know, this is about culture change mm-hmm. and we all have a role in that. Um, but I think the IBA report in and of itself, I think, is, is hugely important. And I suppose, obviously, it's led to the Law Society's response in, in commissioning this piece of work. Yeah. But it does show it's an international report. So it does show that, you know, these are widespread issues, frankly. Yeah. I know. And I know from the IBA wellbeing survey that was carried out this year or released this year, um, it was um, shown that when experienced harassment and bullying actually have the greatest ne- negative impact on, on people's well-being. Um, so that, you know, it comes before unrealistic time pressures, you know, um, the inability to take breaks. It's, it's, it's one of the, the most hard hitting in terms of, of factors that affects people's well-being. Um, and also, you know, it was interesting from the IBA well-being, sorry, the IBA report, um, they also found that, you know, those who are bullied or harassed are, are unlikely to perform at their best and they often leave the profession or they move to another workplace. So it just kind of is chiming in with what you're saying there. Yeah. And I think, you know, that is, I suppose it's an important thing to flag as well for employers. You know, at mm-hmm. the end of the day, you want a committed, you know, energetic, productive workforce mm-hmm. and you know, where there's an environment that's stressful, where there's bullying and harassment at work in an organization, you know, you're going to see more absence, you're going to see, you know, more, more turnover. Um, I mean, they're just basic things that are, you know, really important to consider in the wider context of bullying and harassment that actually, it does have a very negative impact on your organization Mm -hmm. in general. And Alwyn, what is your experience of, of trying to tackle bullying, you know, harassment and sexual harassment in, in the arts sector? What can we learn from, from that work? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd love to say the job of work is done, but unfortunately, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're still working through it. But I can tell you a bit about what we've been able to do so far mm. and what our plans are. So um, really, I suppose the, the issue of bullying and harassment and sexual harassment kind of came very much to international prominence in the arts, particularly film and theatre um, in late 2017, when the Me Too hashtag really took off online. Mm -hmm. And um, within a short space of time, there were, you know, very clear conversations happening online in Ireland, as well as, you know, around the world, but Mm -hmm. uh, but here specifically about experiences people had had uh, working in theatre and in other um, art art forms Um, but really theatre was the focus in late 2017 and I suppose it you know this this really created a catalyst for how could the sac how could the sector respond Um, Mm. you know acknowledging that people had had very difficult experiences they were in the main historic but you know were still very relevant Mm. Um, and as a result the theatre sector itself came together and had a discussion and really it was out of that that the Speak Up and Call It Out project launched led by the Irish Theatre Institute um, and funded by the Department of as it was at the time Culture Heritage and Heritage in the Gaelic it's got a far broader remit now that I can never remember Um, and really the the idea behind Speak Up was to bring the sector together to come up with solutions so that everybody could get involved in making change happen Um, and that in 2018 led to the development of a code of conduct for theatre um, and it was piloted with a number of theatre companies and really what that was looking at was you know how do we work together to ensure we create a culture of uh, positivity of good uh, working relationships um, and also of frankly if things are not uh, as they should be that we can speak up about it so it set out a very clear kind of commitment that everybody signed up to and um, so that was the that was the first phase of speak up and call it out and then the second phase which is what's underway at the moment is um, speak up and call it out act on with a little eye in the middle for information so action um, and that has involved a survey similar to the law society's uh, survey uh, it's currently being analyzed for a first stage report at the end of next month and then a more detailed report in the autumn but why are we doing it well frankly very similar reasons to the law society so we want to understand as a next phase of activity 
you know, we've put in place a code of conduct. Has that made a big difference? Are there still issues? And also importantly, this particular approach, the second phase of Speak Up is actually across the arts. So the first phase was theatre specific, but now we're looking at the entire arts community. Um, and really it's, it's about a, identifying what's actually happening. So what have people been experiencing over what period of time? Who is responsible? You know, who are the perpetrators? Um, and also what was available to them? And I suppose this is to your point about how do we make change happen? Um, you know, we need to look at the supports that were available or not, or mm -hmm. um, what people perceived might be available to them, or if they didn't know what was available to them by way mm -hmm. of recourse or dealing with the issues that arose. Um, and then we've also asked people to talk about the sort of solutions they'd like to see. So, mm -hmm. you know, why you do a survey like this? Well, you want to understand what the issues are so you can respond to them and create, you know, a sector wide approach. So that might include by the time we, we get to the second phase report, we, we, we imagine we're going to do training along the lines of things like bystander training, but also creating other forms of training that the sector can use to really raise awareness mm -hmm. and create confidence in taking a, a proactive response to the issues should they arise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is. There are similar, I suppose, there are similarities in that regard. There are similarities. You know? mm, yeah, I'm just thinking about you know that that piece there, and it's it the whole sector. It's a really kind of you know thinking about all the different parts of the art sector. Um, it's it's very similar to the approach that this survey is taking. It's a it's it's an evidence based program. It starts with a survey, um, and it's it's profession wide. It really is trying to understand you know, from everybody's perspective. Um, oops, sorry, <laughs> for one second, my phone is ringing. That always happens during a, a, a webinar. Um, so yeah, just it's it's trying to understand from all the different, um, you know, departments, sections, firms, yeah. you know, pract um, uh, practicing principal um, and individual solicitors. So understanding from all those, 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 those elements. Um, I suppose I'm kind of interested um, all in, in you know how you think firms practice principles individual solicitors um can create a positive workplace culture um that doesn't tolerate this type of unprofessional unprofessional behavior what yeah do you think about that? it's i'd love to say there is just a single solution if you just do this mm -hmm. everything will be fine um but actually you know as we all know like organizational culture is comprised of all sorts of different elements um and and really all of those elements contribute to the experience people have when they work in an organization regardless of what sector it's in um and i think from from the point of view of where it should start i think you know culture comes from the top Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's anybody who's uh, tuned into anything around governance of late will hear the phrase the tone at the top. And I think, you know, what uh, examples are set at that level of an organization really drive behavior throughout an organization. So, you know, if you have a senior person, who, whoever that might be, be it the, you know, the principal of the firm or, you know, if it's a company, a CEO or you know, however, whichever level you want to start with, mm -hmm. that that at the very top, the pinnacle of the organization, the behaviors exhibited at that level really drive what happens everywhere else in the organization. And um, so, you know, if you're a practice principal who, you know, behaves with integrity, shows respect to your mm -hmm. colleagues, uh, if there's an issue, it's dealt with clearly, there's transparency in the way things are handled. I think that's a very good place to start. The other things in a more practical way than I suppose would be the infrastructure that provides people with the information they need if there is an issue. So for instance, things like policies, processes for reporting and addressing issues, making sure they're clearly communicated and that people know about them and also trust them. So, I mean, one of the issues we, we feel uh, you know, is, is likely to come through in in some in the in the um, ITI survey only again based on anecdotal sort of insight is that people are not not really sure what's available to them. Like how do we, and I mean, this would be based on, let's say what came through in, in Me Too a couple of years ago that, you know, people might have an idea there's a bullying and harassment policy, but you know, who do I talk to about it? How do I report? If I do report, you know, is something gonna happen? So actually feeling confident in the process 
you'll always know in an organization when it's transparent this is if such and such happens this is the policy you need to look at and this is who yeah. you talk to straight clear focused um action that makes life an awful lot easier for both the organization and those employed by it and um, where it's sort of seen as oh yeah we have a policy somewhere about that or you know you could talk to so and so about that um, it doesn't really give confidence to anybody to actually, you know, pursue uh, an issue if it arises. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what I would say, though, is prevention is better than cure. You know, the old adage. Um, yeah. So, you know, really creating an environment where people feel respected and valued um, is, is a far better thing than having to find yourself in a situation where you're crisis managing because, you know, certain types of behaviours have been tolerated over time mm -hmm. as opposed to being dealt with. And um, so, yeah, as I said, if you kind of think of like culture being a jigsaw, you know, it's not just one piece on its own. There are lots of different pieces that fit together to create mm -hmm. that kind of supportive, inclusive culture. Yeah. And I suppose contributing or participating in this survey can really help contribute to that that bigger piece, you know, the, putting the jigsaw together and um, to ensure that there's toolkits and there's supports in place for, for the small, medium and larger firms to kind of work on this um, together, but also individually. Absolutely, um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's the whole reason why this survey is happening. And indeed the, the survey that we've been running with the Irish Theatre Institute, I've been running separately in another project, um, is, is to garner a real clear insight, you know, much in the same way as the, the IBA report was able to identify top line findings, it was also able to point to recommendations and to, you know, provide clarity to support the sector to come together um, and address these issues. And I think that's actually, you know, frankly, that is the most important thing. It, it, you know, it's, it isn't necessarily about saying, oh, well, you're not doing this the right way. It's actually about, mm -hmm. well, how do we support our sector to, mm -hmm. you know, put the supports in place we need for our, for both you know for smaller organizations as well as, well as bigger organizations mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. resource constraints for small organizations which mm -hmm. I would have seen a lot in the arts mm -hmm. means that you know there can be a bit of informality there can be a little bit of you know we do have a something in place about that but not 100% sure and mm -hmm. um, so being able to equip the entire sector with here are the tools and here's how you use them mm -hmm. of course it's going to create widespread culture change and and really mm -hmm. you know improve people's working experiences across the sector yeah yeah and i suppose i you know before coming on today i was thinking about you know small practices and the types of unprofessional behavior that they might experience um, and we've talked about this a little bit alwyn but yeah. you know sometimes we've Anecdotally, we've heard that, you know, um, bullying can come from clients. Um, yeah. And I suppose I was, I was, you know, thinking what, what advice or, you know, um, thoughts have you on that for our, our um, small practice? And sure. Listeners? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think the important thing to say is it's I mean, it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, legislation as it currently stands, you know, includes clients as well as, you know, uh, other other individuals that you might be interacting with in the course of your work, um, where it's a single individual running an organization or running a practice. I think that's where it could get a bit tricky, because mm -hmm. obviously, if you're if you're a solicitor working in a practice, there's a clear policy that policy can be lent on very easily and a conversation had with said client along the lines of, you know, this is not acceptable based on our bullying and harassment policy. Mm -hmm. However, if you're a single, I suppose I would use the language if you're a single contractor, if you're a single solicitor running a practice, mm -hmm. I think potentially a workaround there is, you know, that that legislation applies in general. So, mm -hmm. you know, it would apply in that instance. However, what I thought, you know, thinking about the situation somebody might find themselves in, it, it may come down to even contractual ag agreements with clients to be able to point out clearly, you know, these are this, you know, these are the standards um, expected in this engagement on both sides. Mm -hmm. And where there is a breach of those standards, then I think it would be reasonable to either at, at a starting point, I mean, even thinking about how you might deal with it if you were an employee, the first step in any situation like that would be to address the complaint directly to the individual who who is the perpetrator in this instance and um, so to, to give them an opportunity to rectify their behavior mm -hmm. however if it's a repeat offense which you know in general we say with, with bullying once off isn't considered to be bullying quote unquote mm -hmm. but 
if it's a repeat offence, I think then, you know, an individual contra- or individual solicitor will be within their rights to say, look, within the, the, the context of this contractual agra- arrangement, this agreement, you know, I'm going to have to give you notice mm-hmm. because I cannot, con- you know, you're con- contravening the agreement. Mm-hmm. But obviously yeah. you would go through a couple of steps may- maybe before having to make that final decision. But, yeah. you know, it is, as I said, you know, anybody in that situation, if you're being bullied by a client, it is the same as being bullied by a boss or by yeah. a colleague. You know, the, the context is more or less the same. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I think that will, you know, just even having that kind of some form of um, thoughts and clarity around it, because, yeah. it, 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 you know, I think that we talked about this previously, bullying, harassment, sexual harassment. It's very messy. It's kind of people don't, you know, it's like a hot potato and nobody wants to talk about it. You kind of want to go away from it. But actually, I think that's what I'm understanding this survey and will co- the findings of this survey will contribute to more clarity, less confusion, um, you know, signposts guidance what what happens if this if this occurs what you can do um yeah absolutely julie and i mean i think the thing is is that you know that is a prime example of an issue that may come through in the survey strongly which means that you know more kind of comprehensive advice can be given to let's say smaller practitioners who might find Mm -hmm. themselves in that situation but it is the message there is it's not acceptable it doesn't have to be an employee colleague or a boss if it's a client Mm -hmm. it is also considered to be bullying and therefore Mm -hmm. you know I think um that you know the the clarity there is it's just it's not acceptable you shouldn't accept it from a client you wouldn't accept it hopefully you wouldn't accept it from a colleague or a boss you know you would report it so yeah but again to your point I mean I think the main thing is being able to uncover what are the main issues so that you know the sort of tools and supports that might be required can be put in place Great. And I might just speak a little bit about the Dignity Matters survey to everybody here today. Um, we've talked about it. Some people might have heard about it. It has been communicated out through our e-zine and, and various other communication channels. But just to let you know, at the start of May, so on the 6th of May, an email was sent by Crow to everyone on the role of solicitors who's ever practiced in Ireland um, with a link to the Dignity Matters survey. Um, so the survey is confidential. Um, and it asks about solicitors' subjective experience of previous or current workplaces. Um, specifically, um, it asks about bullying, harassment, and sexual harassment. Um, the, the intention of the survey is to, um, cr- um, to result in a, a change program um, to implement um, research recommendations from the survey. And, and all this will happen upon approval by the, the Law Society Council. And so through this, we hope to support solicitors transform workplace culture by by putting in place the the, the right supports, by having a better understanding around how prevalent um, bullying, harassment and sexual harassment is and what the nature of it is and what's there at the moment to support people and if these mechanisms are working. Um, So we'd like to just say thanks to everybody who's participated so far. Um, and if you haven't received the survey, which we really hope you have, but if you haven't, um, it's, um, we would advise you to email Deirdre O'Reilly at crow.ie. So um, Justin will be showing a, a PowerPoint at the end of this session and Deirdre's email is on that. So it's Deirdre.O'Reilly at crow.ie and Deirdre will share that survey link with you. Um, I suppose just a couple of things that are kind of important to remember about the survey is that it is very much asking about your subjective experience of bullying, harassment or sexual harassment. That experience does not need to meet legal requirements for bullying, harassment or sexual harassment. Um, It is confidential. Crow are abiding by ethical research guidelines um, and you won't be legally bound by any of your answers. Um, that's also something, you know, when we were thinking about this, it's really important to just make that clear to everybody as solicitors. Um, Also, the survey is open to practicing and to formally practicing solicitors. So, you know, you don't have to be a practicing solicitor to be involved. In fact, you may have really unique insights um, as a, you know, formally practicing solicitor. Um, And I suppose the very last thing to say about it is, it's we really want to hear from people who've had a positive experience as well 
Um, so, you know, this if, if we got all the, the, the negative experiences, it wouldn't be a very um, accurate representation of our workplaces. Um, so it's really important that we this isn't just for bullying for those who've experienced or have been bystanders to bullying, harassment or sexual harassment. It's so important that we hear from everybody. So that's why we're really, really hoping that you can spread the word um, and yeah, encourage everybody to, to get involved so that we, we, we can kind of stand over our findings and say, actually, we heard from everybody. Um, yeah, and there's more information on this slide from um, here. So you can find out there's a Gazette article on it and you can also email me if you would like to find out more about it. And there's my email address there. So I don't know, Alwyn, do you want to add anything else to, did you think there's anything that we didn't cover today um, um. around this? I think we've managed to cover a fair bit of ground, but I would just say I would really encourage people like you, Julie, I would encourage people to, to complete the survey. Um, you know, that's how we make change happen. You know, evidence is, is what we need to, to create that change and everybody can be part of that. Um, and as you say, I suppose, just to add to that as well, I mean, you may have actually found yourself in a situation where you've been a bystander rather than somebody's experienced something, and that is just as valid. Um, so, you know, do ensure if you've maybe seen something that, you know, might have been could have been a couple of years ago, might have been something that you just think, well, I don't need to respond because it didn't happen to me. Please do ensure that you fill it in, even if you are a bystander. Yeah, and just to say also that, you know, it can bring up issues and distress for individuals when they are completing the survey. It could, if you have experienced um, either, you know, bullying, harassment or sexual harassment um, yourself or being a bystander to it, um, it, it may be distressing um, to you. So there are supports available um, to solicitors. There is Legal Mind, which is a low cost mental health support. Um, and they have a free phone number and anybody can call them at any time of the day or night. Um, any solicitors can call that um, number. Um, so you can just get in the moment support um, and that's completely free or you can move on to, to more kind of dedicated sessions with a counsellor, therapist, um, a series of sessions. So that's really it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks all. Thanks all and Julie. Thanks, uh, if anybody would like uh, uh, like to ask a question, we'll, we'll, we have a minute or two just on, on the chat if anybody wants to ask a question. And just while we're waiting, uh, I'll just uh, run through the future sessions that we're having uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so maximizing practice profitability, benefits of document assembly technology, uh, the uh, Legal Services Authority are coming in to talk about limited liability partnerships on the 9th of June, diversity and quality on the 16th of June, and then the Revenue Commissioners are coming in to talk to us about a new uh, e-withholding uh, tax procedure that they're implementing at the moment. So, so maybe I just at, at, at this point to say it's really important that people would fill out this survey, this Dignity Matters survey, uh, as Julian and, uh, and Alwyn have been talking about earlier. So and spread I can't the see word. any questions coming in. I suppose, Alwyn, while we have you there, like what what should I do if I see something happening uh, that I'm not that comfortable about? Like what are the kind of steps? What Who should I ring or where should I go? Or what, from an yeah, employee I'm perspective or... Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it, it kind of depends on the, the context of the issue. I mean, I've, I've mentioned bystanders as, a, you know, a key cohort to be filling in the survey. Um, and I suppose they play a key role. If you're somebody who's seen something, for instance, as you mentioned, um, very often it's, you know, I think people feel that they should have to jump in at the time and sort of, you know, make an intervention. In fact, actually, you can be a bystander in a very low key way. You can sort of say at the time, ah, I think that was okay, you know, or to the person it happened to, are you all right? Would you like me to say something? And um, they're kind of simple ways that you can make an intervention. Um, but if you, if it's, if it happens to you in your employment, as I've said earlier on, I mean, the important thing is that organizations have that step-by-step -step process in place, which generally a dignity at work policy or a bullying and harassment policy will have, you know, literally a series of steps that you would, you would go through in the first instance, people generally will try to uh, ameliorate the situation informally by having an initial conversation with the person who has uh, perpetrated something towards them that they found challenging, whatever that might be. But um, generally it's, it's, it's resolved informally first before going into a more formal process. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can send on lots more info on that if it's helpful, but certainly bystanders are becoming a critical issue in this whole conversation because they play a really critical role in, I suppose, 
check, keeping that, you know, that culture in check. You know, you don't have to be somebody who jumps in and, and as I said, kind of feels that they have to call out the behavior, but you can do it in more subtle ways too. Um, and I, I know certainly in the work I'm doing in the arts, we're talking a lot about that in terms of training, showing people how to be effective bystanders. Top. Thanks very much, Alwyn. Thanks, Lynn and Julie. We're coming up to an end, end of our, our, our time here today. So thanks everyone for joining us on this small practice information session. Next week, we're, we're, we're on a different bent. We're off to discuss maximizing practice profitability with uh, Pat McCosker from Solest. Uh, also a, a man from Donegal also. So, uh, so we look forward to, to, to talking to him about how we improve the profitability in, in our practices. So everybody, thanks a million for joining us today. I really encourage you to, to fill out the, the, the Dignity Manager survey, really important issue. And uh, Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Alwyn. And we'll talk again soon. Sláin.